So ladies and gentlemen, when Ronald Turpin and Arthur Lu Lucas were executed by hanging in 1963 uh, during the same evening, it marked the last uh, capital murder executions in our nation's history. Soon after, the, uh, the lobby against execution became strong because of the Truscott case and other botched uh, executions and botched investigations where some believe the innocent were put on death row. Now, today we're going to be uh, talking verbatim from a very important article Toronto Star did in 2012 by staff reporter Till, uh, Tim uh, uh, Lamignac, uh, which was called The End of the Rope, the Story of Canada's Last Executions. Now, why I'm doing this is the definitive article. Now, uh, it's, it's something that really, really struck home with me. As a young reporter, I was covering numerous murders in northern New Brunswick and also was an avid uh, reader of the last uh, compilation book that I remember of all the, mur the executions for murder in Canada with the provinces and the territories, and the Toronto Star article used some of their details. So we're going to provide some of the uh, verbatim uh, information from it, and I'll expand a little bit on what he presented. Now, in the article, we start with Bron Bronwell Everett knew something went wrong when his father came home from the Don Jail with his blue Salvation Army chaplain's uniform splattered with blood. Something went terribly wrong, terribly wrong, Cyril Everett said on that December night in 1962. Sorry, I said 63. I always get a little bit confused. Uh, we'll make it uh, a correction. I don't want to get into it now, but something went terribly wrong. It's been 50 years since two men hung from the gallows in Toronto's Don Jail. This article was 2012. The last to receive capital punishment in Canada. Cyril was their chaplain, a man committed to saving the souls of two convicted killers whose lives were scheduled in. Ronald Turpin, 29, was a petty thief who shot a police officer, and Arthur Lucas, 54, was a career criminal and pimp from Detroit who killed two people slated to be witnesses in a major drug trial. They were both tried and convicted within a year of their crimes. Half a century later, questions still linger about what exactly happened on those two fateful nights. Doubts exist about the fairness of their trials, enough that the Association Defense of the Wrongly Convicted has opened a file on Lucas's death. Now, one thing remains certain. Lucas and Turpin were killed December 11th at 12.02 a.m. as the hangman slid the grease plank out from under the trap doors in the Don Jail. The event drew mass protests on the night of the hangings. The murder cases sped through the courts at a pace that would be considered remarkable today. Lucas committed his crime in November 61 and Tarpon in February 1962. They would be dead again a year later, or close a year later. Defender charged with their cases, Ross McKay, 29 at the time, was recognized as bright but inexperienced. His daughter, Allison, practiced with criminal law in Brampton and remembers her father as a passionate lawyer for those accused of murder. He just defended a lot of murders, I think far too many. He'd do one after the other, Allison said. He offered gold to Kingston Penitentiary. He thought it was important to go even for, even after trial to see the, those people. Now, McKay, who died in 1983, still firmly believing that neither Lucas nor Turpin deserved to hang. Turpin never denied shooting Nash, but Lucas maintained his innocence until he dropped into gallows. Now, questions linger. Turpin certainly shot Nash, but his trial was held in Toronto amidst the public fewer that comes after a cop is shot. Much of the evidence in the Lucas case was circumstantial. But trials wrapped up and sentenced to men to death in fewer than 12 months. They really weren't giving a fair trial in either case, said Allison. The trials were too quick, she said. Pleas from her father for a change of location for Turpin's trials fell on deaf ears. Now, Lucas's trial was McKay's first murder case. He defended both men back to back. They hung like that together, hands and feet bound, in the crab gallows at the Don Jail. Their crimes both deemed capital, their character unfit for this world. On November 1661, Lucas made a trip from Detroit to Toronto. He registered for a room at the Waverly Hotel, a budget hotel near the Silver Dollar Room on Spadina Avenue. A man named Willie White registered with him. On the night of his arrival, Lucas phoned Thurlon Crater, an associate from Detroit who was staying nearby on Kendall Avenue in the Annex. Crater was a small-time drug dealer and pimp who helped people arrest Gus Saunders, a big trafficker at the time who was slated to testify at his trial. Crater went to Toronto to stay safe. Luca, Lucas went to Crater's uh, place at 3 a.m. 
according to court records. He made a call from Crater's phone to his apartment back in Detroit. After the visit, Lucas returned to the hotel. He checked out shortly after arriving back around 6 a.m., and Willie White also checked out. The landlord at the Kendall Avenue house phoned police after one of the other residents in the house saw a pair of legs through the front window. Crater laid his back in the downstairs hallway, his neck an open football shaped wound. He was shot four times, overkill, the medical examiner found. He actually died from the neck wound. Upstairs, his wife, Carolyn Ann Newman, lay on the bed with her throat also cut. She was nearly decapitated, said police reports at the time. A ring belonging to Lucas lay in a pool of her blood. The double murder was splashed across the front pages of the Star in the days that followed. Court records show police found a discarded revolver on a Burlington Skyway. Expert matched it to the bullets in Crater's body. By the time uh, Lucas returned to Detroit, people were already waiting. They found bloody articles of clothing in the car. Now, the Toronto-based association in defense of the wrongly convicted is looking into Lucas's case after requests from his family. People are claiming he's innocent. If he is, he is. He deserves to have his name cleared. We've been looking at it for a couple of years, said Wynne Wayner, the director of client services. Wayner speaks weekly with Larry Conway, son of Arthur Lucas. He's phones from Detroit still haunted by his father's debt. I talked to him one time over the phone. Conn remembered. He said he would be home. I didn't think he was in trouble. He didn't think he was in trouble. Conway's voice trailed off. Every time I talk about this, I break down and uh, cry. Wayher declined to give any details on her assessment of the case, stating it was still under investigation. Now, Lucas has maintained he's innocent until the end of his life, even when his death was certain, and Sally Ann Chaplin, Cyril Everett, offered him the chance of a clean conscience true confession. Allison's father, their defender, believed Lucas was innocent until the end, whether by blind conviction to his task as an offense attorney or faith in facts, Ross's belief has been passed on to his daughter. He didn't have the sophistication to plan and kill like that. He looked like a complete setup, like a ring who supposedly wore his place within inches of the lady's body. Somehow the gun he used to shoot the man, he's supposed to throw over the bridge, yet is found just on the ground. Now, the, the case of Turpin is clear. There's no doubt that he shot Nash. For Allison, the doubt comes from what exactly transpired the night of the shooting and a trial that followed. Turpin was a 29-year-old with a pension for petty theft. On February 12, 62, he broke into Red Rooster Inn on the Danfort with $631 in loot. He fled west. Constable uh, Frederick Nash, 31, was on shift that night. He pulled Turpin's truck over near Dawes for a routine, a routine check. What happened next was anything but. Two men were shot that night. Nash was hit at close range through the stomach, and the wound was fatal. He died on the scene. Turpin was shot in the arm and in the face, carving a scar into his left cheek that would give him mug shots. Uh, his mug shots had sinister appearance. Now, Turpin never denied shooting Nash. He was caught red-handed. But the circumstances of the shooting are still the subject of debate, as is the trial. Ross applied it had to be transferred to another city, where the jury may be less biased, but was denied. Now, the media had covered uh, that and already were saying the officer died a hero. Father of four daughters, and this is horrific, said Allison. Basically, the whole city seemed to want this man convicted before the trial started. Now, Bram, Bramwell Everett remembers his father's last minute's attempts to save the lives of the men. He was watching the 50th Grey Cup on TV at home. The phone rang. Dead 21-year-old Bram answered. Hello, Deephan Baker, is your father there, said a voice in the other end. I nearly dropped the phone, Bradwell said in the interview with the Star. Uh, the 13th Prime Minister of Canada was phoning to speak with Cyril, offering a slim chance for clemency for Lucas. Turpin, he said, was done, shooting a cop carrying an automatic death sentence at the time. Lucas was unwavering his profession of innocence, but at peace with the penalty. He always maintained to my father that he didn't do it, but he also said he'd done many other terrible things in his so-called career that was just catching up with him, said Bram. I'm telling you I didn't do it, but I'm ready to go. I did some other things in my life, Lucas would say to Cyril. Now, Bram remembers when his father left to be by their side. He was their constant companion throughout the incarceration and determined to be there at the end. Putting on his dark blue Sally Ann Chaplin's uniform, Cyril bid his wife and son goodbye and headed to the John Jail. Now, December 10, 62 was a cold and windy day. The hanging was scheduled for 12 a.m. December 11th. Cyril would have walked up the regal steps of the Don Jail, a bus of father time staring from the archway, as a reminder that time was up for the two men. Neither had any last words on the gallows, but Everett later said to the star that it was dwindling hours of life, Turpin said, 
If our dying means capital punishment in this country, we will be abolished for good. We will not have died in vain. Now, while Cyril was at the jail, Leland White, Turpin's common-law wife, called Bram at home, as she'd done regularly while Turpin was incarcerated. She was a really lovely lady. Dad had met her with her a couple of times. She phoned the night of the hanging after my father had gone and asked if my father would call her when he got home. The men passed their final hours, much like they had the previous year, speaking, uh, speaking with the chaplain. They ate steak together, and when the hour arrived, walked down the Don Jail stone hallway towards the gallows. Now, hoods were placed over the heads of the men, their last vision, a flat gray gallows wall with wooden beams overhead, a room not more than six feet deep, the face of their chaplain, guards, the executioner. The star reported that Cyril read Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. It reads in part, The pair had a signal with Cyril. He would say a phrase, signaling to the hangman it was time to loose the trap door, and he would fall to their nets. The last words we were supposed to hear were, My eyes have seen thy salvation. They never heard of the end of the word salvation, said Silva Cyril in the interview with his alien. Turpin died quickly, cleanly. Uh, Lucas wasn't so lucky. Their chaplain later described a bloody scene. Lucas's head was torn right off. It was hanging just by the sinews of the neck. There was blood all over the floor, said Everett in an interview with Sally Ann's internal newsletter. Now, the deaths of Lucas and Turpin brought the total number of people executed in Canada to 710. All of them were hanged. The death penalty lingered in Canadian law for more than a decade. The government of Lester B. Pearson passed legislation in 67 to temporarily suspend executions for murder, except in cases of police and prison guards. Now, the death penalty was eventually abolished in July 26, 76, with the passage of the bill bearing its use introduced, uh, banning its use from, uh, uh, introduced by the government of Pierre Trudeau. Today, the, gall the gallows at the Don Jail have been taken down. A ghostly outline of the timbers remains on a wall, preserved as a reminder of what, is once, what was once commonplace. The building itself is being removed uh, to re become offices for Bridgeport Health. The cells where Turpin and Lucas's where cells where Turpin and Lucas spent their last few hours have been taken out, replaced with a kitchenette and washroom for the nearby meeting area. After the hanging and customary verification of death, the bodies were taken down and carted to a mass grave at Prospect Cemetery near St. Clair in Caledonia. Cyril was there to say the last words. He later uh, told uh, he later, uh, he later told stories that uh, people, likely police and prison officials, were standing around smoking. He had them all put out their cigarettes and smoked the final committal for the damned men. Now, when I came to the part about, as it has pleased Almighty God, I left that out because I didn't think it had pleased God. Now that's the Toronto Star's take on the uh, the last executions in Canadian history. If you'd like to leave a comment or a uh, suggestion for a future true crime podcast, please do so. I have a archive of numerous podcasts on various last and uh, what do you call uh, historical executions in Canadian history. Please give it a listen. We're doing this podcast not to exploit the, uh, the victims or the uh, the executed, but as a public service. We hope you understand. Have a good day. Bye.